Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fed Life Podcast. Once again, I am your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving Those Serve and Lease Life and Associates. As is my practice, I always want to say thank you for taking the time to listen. You can listen to anything you're listening to this, and I'm grateful. But also, I want to thank you for your service. Your service to the country, your service to me, your service to the entire community. You simply do not hear that enough, and you should hear it more. Once again, we are back with the guru, Ed Zerndorfer, the incomparable one, as part of our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you, the career fed. At the outset, as I have to do every time, I need to say the opinions of our guest, Ed Zerndorfer, not the opinions of Raymond James or serving those who serve, although we really like him a lot. Uh, this podcast is presented for information only and not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. So today we are continuing, as we promised in our last podcast, with the healthcare theme, and Ed and I will be talking about healthcare flexible spending accounts, HCFSAs. We do love our acronyms, and we have one more for you: uh, health reimbursement arrangements. I'm Dan. He's Ed. We're here to help Fed. So let's go. So Ed, in our last episode, we talked about the health savings accounts or HSA, and while healthcare FSAs might have similarities, they're still fairly different, correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. So let's talk about the similarities. Feds can put in money pre-tax? Feds, uh, federal employees can contribute to health care FSAs with pre It has to be pre-tax money. Uh, they can contribute uh, in 2020. It was just increased by the IRS up to $2,750. $2,750. Okay. Uh, last, in 2019, it was $2,700. That is per federal employee. So we have two federal employees. Each could put in twenty seven hundred for a total of fifty four hundred dollars. Uh, Ed, I was going to say that Ed. I was going to let him know I was smart with math. <laughs> okay, and so the eligibility is also a little bit different. Yes, uh, Dan, the eligibility is different because, in, and we were talking about HSAs. In order to contribute to an HSA, you have to be contri- you have to be covered by a high deductible health insurance plan. With the health care FSAs. You, do, you can be enrolled in any plan you want. It can be a, a uh, fee-for-service plan. It could be a HMO. It doesn't have to be under the Federal Employees Health Insurance. Let's say somebody's under TRICARE, which is okay, the health sure. insurance for the military. Uh, we see that a lot. Okay. You do, uh, there's no requirement that you be enrolled in a Federal Employees Health Insurance in order to participate in a health care FSA. Dan, the key word is that if you're eligible to be enroll in the Federal Employees Health Insurance Benefits Program, FEHB, you are eligible to participate in the health care FSAs, but there's no requirement that you actually be enrolled in an FEHB plan. Okay, so kind of looping back to the other podcasts, which hopefully everybody listened to, I remember you had a little bit of a caution saying, you know, if you're a couple with young kids going to the pediatrician a lot or you have, you have athletic kids that, that, you know, do get injuries here and there, that the high deductible health plan might not be the best option for them if they were in a non-high deductible health plan. This is something they could still do, right? Absolutely. Wow. It does, and it doesn't have to be the federal plan. Federal okay. plan. So that that's uh, that's a plus. But the requirement is is the same or similar that it has to be for qualified medical expenses when you take it out. Well, the money's going in with pre-tax dollars. The money withdrawn from the health care FSA will be tax-free, provided it's, pay, it's, it's used to pay for qualified medical, dental, or vision expenses. Okay. Also, with the health care FSA, you can be reimbursed for your travel to the doctor or dentist or pay for parking. Really? Yes. They do pay you, reimburse you for your, for your travel. IRS has a certain certain amount of mile of uh, mileage reimbursement for medical exp- medical expenses. It's I think twenty three cents a mile. Okay, well, hey, folks in the DMV, raise your hands right now if you have to pay for parking at your doctor's office. And if your doctor doesn't validate, because I have at least one who doesn't, that's a great that's a great perk right there. 
or getting re getting reimbursed for your Uber ride or your me metro sure. or your metro uh, ride things nice. like that. Uh, par getting paid for parking, so you can get reimbursed for all these expenses related to your medical, dental, vision care. And you also mentioned. In your article, that's covered in the IRS publication 502, but it's also on the FSA Fed's website. The FSA Fed's website has a list of so-called eligible expenses, and I believe I put the link in my you did. code, though, you did. which and expenses a... are or are not, okay? Because there are some expenses that will not be reimbursed. Sure, and, and that's uh, fsafeds.com slash explore slash HCFSA slash expenses. And again, don't worry. This is at the SDWServe website at blog.sdwServe.com. And Ed's got all the links, so don't don't worry about that. Our podcasts will always mirror Ed's articles. So, and we were talking about it today down in the seminar that we want to be able to get the information out to you as many different ways as possible, so you can take it in and what works for you. So, if you got your earbuds in on the metro and you're catching up on this, that's fantastic. If you want to listen to it at home, that's great too. So. All right, now, Ed, in the article, if someone is in a high-deductible health plan with a health care savings account, this isn't available. That is correct, Dan. Um, if someone is enrolled in a health savings account, they are, uh, then they cannot be also enrolled in a health care flexible spending account. Okay. Um, however, Ooh. one could enroll in a special type of healthcare flexible spending account. It's called a LEX, which stands for Limited Expense Healthcare FSA. When I say limited expense, this particular FS the, of healthcare flexible spending account will only pay for out-of-pocket dental and vision expenses. Okay. So if you're enrolled in a HSA, you could also enroll in a LEX, which stands, again, for Limited Expense uh, Healthcare FSA, and set aside, again, maximum for 2020, $2,750. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you could are also putting money into your HSA. So there could be a nice amount of savings there for saving, for pay for out-of-pocket medical expenses. And, you know, a lot of times you, you, do, you do know a bit in advance when you might be running into some medical or rather some dental expenses coming down the road, we, we sort of tend to, it's not all, it's not like the good old days where you broke a tooth and <laughs> run to the dentist like you used to, you know, if, if you're looking into something like you may have need to have some dental implants or that sort of thing, this could be another way to get some money aside for that. That is correct, Dan. And now since it is open season and employees can enroll in dental and or vision insurance, what I suggest employees do during this current open season, again, mm -hmm. the last through December 9th, it started yesterday, is to look back this past year and see what they have paid out of pocket for medical, mm -hmm. dental, vision expenses. Look ahead to 2020 and see what they expect to be some maybe some expenses. For example, you have a child that uh, is going to getting will be getting orthodontics. Sure. In 2020, you have an idea what the bill will be. However, the question is, what is the best way to pay for it? When do you get a deduction? When do you get a deduction? <laughs> well, of course, of course, you could enroll in the de separate dental insurance. You found a plan, mm -hmm. but no dental insurance plan is going to pay the whole thing. Oh, you, I know. You, 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 know, you know they don't pay for everything. Uh, that, okay, um, my, my kids are, are in college now with really good-looking teeth, Ed, so I know that it's I covered. hear you, Dan. I have, I have four kids, and my, our orthodontics, uh, our, there, was no, there was no dental insurance, and we put his kids to Harvard Medical School. They go pay for it. But anyhow, Dan, I would suggest that you run the numbers here to see what would be the most advantageous way to pay for this orthodontic care. Mm -hmm. One way, yes, enroll in the dental insurance, and you could. It takes effect January 1st next year. Or sure. as an alternative, if you have the HSA, you have money in there, and then you could also enroll in the limited expense um, health care FSA. Sure. And between the two of those, there might be enough money to pay for the, the, the orthodontics. I say that because... Most orthodontics um, procedures take about two to three years, and you pay your orthodontics over time. You don't pay them all in a lump sum. So mm -hmm. you could use withdrawals from your HSA, from your uh, limited expense health care FSA, to pay the orthodontics without having to pay the insurance, pay yes. for insurance. It's just a, another, I call that being self-insured. 
by the way. Sure. And and it makes all the sense in the world, Ed. And and again, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to our to our listeners. You know, as you look around your office, if you're closer to Ed's in my bracket and you're past those expenses, please take pity on on your friends and let them know this is gonna be an easy listen podcast and it could get somebody pointed in a direction where they're gonna learn something that's that's really gonna help them. And if you can pay these expenses and have it be deductible, it just feels better. Well, Dan, I just want to add one thing to that, in that, that the people have said to me, well, yeah, I could enroll in the healthcare FSA, but, but rather than doing that, I just would rather pay the expenses out of pocket and get a deduction. In order to get a deduction, you got to fulfill two requirements. One, mm-hmm. you have to itemize when your federal income taxes. Mm-hmm. And with the recent tax law, fewer and fewer people are actually itemizing because they, they, they doubled the standard deduction. Sure. All right. So suppose you cannot. You you can't. You you're gonna. It's advantageous. You have enough on mortgage. You have property taxes. You have you have some state and local taxes. Oh, there's a gotcha coming here. Um, <laughs> your medical expenses, your out of pocket medical, dental, and vision expenses are still theoretically deductible. However, mm-hmm. you have to exceed a certain threshold of your adjusted gross income in order to de- start deducting those expenses. And that threshold was raised. For 2020, to 2020, what it is, uh, what it is currently, from seven and a half percent to ten percent. Ouch! So, if your adjusted gross income of your adjusted gross income, if your adjusted gross income is a hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh, ten thousand. Oh, <laughs> Dan's got it. Ten thousand. You would have to exceed an out-of-pocket medical expenses over ten thousand dollars before you could start deducting them. Someone says to me, "Well, wait a minute now." You can't forget, I'm paying three or $4,000 in, in health insurance premiums and in dental insurance premiums, vision insurance premiums. I can include those, right? Theoretically, yes, except for one problem. Oops. Federal employees have their health insurance premiums, their dental uh, insurance premiums, and vision insurance premium deducted. Conversion. It's called premium conversion deducted pre-tax, pre, premium conversion. Those, Therefore, those expenses can be cannot be, and then in turn, deducted on your income taxes as medical expenses. But I do want to point out Mm -hmm. that during the open season, you have the option of having your health insurance premiums deducted Mm post-tax. And if you do for 2020, then those premiums can be added to your out-of-pocket medical dental vision expenses, and for some, hopefully it doesn't happen to too many people, exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income, then anything above 10% of your adjusted gross income and out-of-pocket expenses will be included as part of your itemized deductions. Gotcha. I want to point out that you cannot make that, that, that request that change for dental vision insurance. Dental and vision insurance will always be subject to premium conversion, always pre-tax. You don't okay. have that option. Well, as always, folks, consult your advisor, but again, share these things around because you're getting a lot of information and your friends will get a lot of information where they can ask better questions, make better decisions. That's what we're here for on this. You know, uh, just just a quick, because this one's going to be a little shorter than most. Uh, if, If you're joining these podcasts sort of midstream here, I came to this when my father in law passed away suddenly. Uh, he was a retired auditor with GSA. I married into a family of four girls. I was the only son in law in the family at the time. I was new to my career. Five heads turned towards me. And there was so much that if he simply knew, he would have made some different decisions. He had some misconceptions. There were some situations where the numbers he told my mother in law to expect and what she got were different, not in the good way. And I couldn't change that. I couldn't fix it. And I'm blessed to say that it, it put me on this path, and and I wouldn't have lived my life any differently. But it 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 never escapes my attention that just getting information out in a way that people can can get it, understand it. If you have questions, you know, come to stwserve.com. You know, click contact us. You know, we take in questions every week. You know, to uh, to be able to answer them. The hard ones we kick over to Ed. So we've, we've got the backup there. But this is all about making sure that, that you, people who have chosen to dedicate their life and their career to serving the public trust, get the information to have the most comfortable and dignified life that you can. And, and that's what we're all about here. 
So, so kick this thing around. You know, if, if, if you never work with serving, there's a serve, that's fine. But if this heads off a problem for somebody or helps them improve their situation, that's really what we want to do. So, Ed, let's, uh, sermon over. Let's, let's talk about enrollment. How would feds go about doing that? Uh, if you want to enroll in the healthcare flexible spending account, whether it's the healthcare FSA or the limited expense healthcare FSA, actually, Dan, there's another FSA out there. Oh, that, that's right. That's that right. Is the not HRA? Related. That is that actually uh, a FSA that is not related to healthcare, and that is a dependent care FSA. Oh, okay. Let's talk about that. that that's a separate FSA that you enroll in that would be used to pay for child care or adult day or adult care. You have mm-hmm. an adult who's your dependents and sure. you have to have somebody with your adult. I, I have had day. both had. Okay. <laughs> uh, and child care for, you know, take for things like nursery school or babysitting summer day camp. That's what the dependent care FSA is. And one could set aside as much as $5,000 to the separate Dependent Care FSA. And and they would find that at FSAFeds.com also? At, at www.FSAFeds.com. FSAFeds.com. Okay. And I know, folks, we were saying we were keeping this around the, the health insurance side, but when you're in open season, hey, there's a lot of daycare out there. There's a lot of summer camps out there. And some of us are, are blessed to be in a situation where we were able to uh, to care for a previous generation. Uh, my wife and I were, were fortunate and blessed to uh, to be able to have her mom, my my father in law's wife, come in with us. Uh, we did not have one of these at the time. I, I would have I would have welcomed it. So that's that's an important thing. So that's www.fsafeds.com, or you can even call like us old guys do on the phone, which is one eight seven seven three seven two three 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 seven. Now, Ed, let's touch on HRAs because we didn't quite get to enough acronyms. The mm-hmm. Health Reimbursement. Arrangement. Arrangements. So let's talk about that. Okay. There is another type of, of tax-preferred uh, health reimbursement account. It's called a health reimbursement account, an HRA. Mm-hmm. Now, who, is, who, would be, who would be eligible to have one of those? If an individual enrolls in a high-deductible health insurance plan. Gotcha. Okay. They want to enroll in an HSA, mm-hmm. but they are ineligible for the HSA. They find out later on they're ineligible okay. for the plan plan. Now, why would they be ineligible? One, they're also enrolled in a health care FSA, not a flex, but a health care. Makes them ineligible. Okay. They, they are over 65, and they're enrolled in Medicare. Okay. As we said earlier, if you're enrolled in Medicare, you cannot contribute to an HSA. Mm-hmm. But they, they, they didn't realize this. So they enrolled, they, they enrolled in, a, in a high deductible health insurance plan, and they find out that they're their, their high deductible health insurance plan told them you're not eligible to contribute to the HSA. Yep. In that case, they will be put automatically in an HRA. Okay. The HRA works differently than the FSA than the FSA. Than, okay. I'm sorry, than the HSA in the following sense. Number one is that the HSA gets credits from the insurance plan. Mm-hmm. Okay. That uh, do not, in most cases, carry over from year to year. Okay. Uh, Number two, you cannot make a, the employee or retiree, and a retiree can actually have an HRA, unlike unlike um, the healthcare FSA. Okay. With the HRA, the HRA is getting credits from the health insurance plan, but does not earn interest. Gotcha. Okay. Withdrawals from the HR, HRA are tax free, provided they're used for qualified medical, dental, vision expenses. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. You lose your HRA when you leave federal service. Ooh, okay. okay. You can't take it with you. It's not your account. But being in Medicare and FEHB, you know, this might be a decent option to explore. It might be. It might be. I want to emphasize, Dan, that if one has an HSA, you could still have an HRA. The only thing is you cannot contribute to the HSA if, you, if, you're, if you're under Medicare. Gotcha. But that does not stop you from making qualified withdrawals from the HSA. We have to distinguish between contributing to the HSA gotcha. and distributing. If you're not qualified to contribute to the HSA, you still are allowed to take money out of the HSA sure. to pay for qualified medical expenses. You're over 65 enrolled in Medicare, Medicare A, B, or whatever, and then you take that money from your HSA to reimburse yourself for Medicare Part B premiums, 
and then you're enrolled in the HRA, and that HRA is paying for things that out of pocket that maybe your Medicare and your health insurance plan are not paying for. Makes so, sense. So you're you have everything covered here. Sure. You know, and I, I think the biggest takeaway, especially for what we've done here today, <clears throat> is that feds first need to know about these options, and it's not that it's not that easy just walking around the office. Sure, you get emails, but speaking. For my father-in-law in his situation, he spent his day doing his job like our feds do. And so it's not always that easy. That's why we're trying to do as many different ways, live, podcast. It, shoot, one of these days, uh, Ed and I will do an interpretive dance probably to, to get the word out. And, Dan, if I can follow up to that, as you mentioned, I'm a retired federal employee myself. And I remember when I came into the government in the early 1970s, mm-hmm. they set us down orientation and said to us, all you got to do is your job because they're going to pull 7% of your paycheck and put it into the CSRS Retirement and Disability Fund. There was no TSP. Mm-hmm. There was one health insurance plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Sure. There was no dental insurance. There was no vision insurance. There were no FSAs. And your, your health insurance plan typically paid for everything. You didn't have to worry about paying anything. It paid even for some of your dental visits. My point is you didn't have to make any choices. Mm-hmm. There, there was not, none of this extra stuff along. Sure. You had to make choice during the open season. Open season meant, do you want to go to from a deductible of maybe $50 to maybe $100 sure. to save yourself some money? That was the only choice there was. Then now, came the 80s. Now we get into the 80s. Yep. FERS comes around. Yep. And the TSP and open season and dental and vision insurance came. The flexible spending accounts came. Now, HSAs were induced in the 2000s. HRAs were induced in the 2000s. Now, feds are bombarded with all these choices that they have to make during open season that not only the employees but even annuitants have to make choices. Sure. I think I mention this all the time when I do seminars. If I got a dollar for every time I am asked this question, what do I have to enroll in Medicare Part B for when I have my federal employees' health insurance? Mm. If I got a dollar for that, I would. if I took a dollar of that, I wouldn't be here today doing these podcasts. Yeah, I know that, so I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think you just might. I think you just might. He's got a great sense of mission here, folks. For most of this stuff, we come back to what tax guys like Ed, again, financial guys like me like to say, it's always cheaper when you can get a deduction. So please, you know, educate yourself, look into these things, come to our website. You're going to find lots of stuff. Uh, Ed, you are always on point. Uh, you've done it again. You gave Fred, Fed's a great framework to make decisions. So folks, that's a wrap. Ed will be back. You're coming back, right? We're, Absolutely. We'll keep doing these. As we work together to reach, teach, and serve you, uh, we are serving those to serve. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel. You can also get it at the website, swserve.com. Remember to share it with friends and strangers. I say that over and over again. And again, seriously, we now have regular listeners. We can see when you're clicking on it. That means the world to us. So right now, think of one of your Fed friends. Text them the link. Email them the link. Uh, whatever. Twitter. WhatsApp. Yell across the office. No, don't do that. But share it with, because if each one will reach one, we are going to be able to do more and more to help this. Isn't that right, Ed? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. And don't forget the seminars every month. Ed is a warrior. Came up here after a full day of, of teaching and, uh, and and recording these. So he's going he's gonna to be here doing that. But Ed Live is an experience you don't want to miss. We've got him in Rockville. We've got him in D.C. We've got him in Columbia. We've got him in, in Arlington. So be sure to, uh, to go to swserve.com, click seminars and events, read every month in the Fed Zone. That's blog.swserve.com. So for Ed, the crew at Serving Those to Serve, and me, Dan Sype, good luck, Godspeed, and above all, remember, it's your Fed life. Make it a great one because you deserve it. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services.
Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Sipe and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations.